and Paul, please mute. And just quick one now. Okay, just welcome, welcome everybody. Uh, my name's Stuart Hedditch, VK3SH, and I'm the president of the Melbourne Electronics and Radio Club for those people who aren't club members. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, and thank you very much to Paul for uh, assisting with this presentation. Um, before I hand over to Paul, just, just one couple of things. We are recording it. It's going to go up on YouTube with a link from our website. So if you have any objections, uh, let us know before we publish it. Um, the other thing is uh, just to make it easier for Paul, if he needs to follow something up or have to make notes, when you first, if necessary, um, give him your first name and your call sign when you come up, if you first speak, just so that he knows who he's talking to. It's just gonna make it easier if during the questions and answers stage later, um, if he has to uh, respond, needs to respond back to you individually. And good day, Craig, how are you today? The, um, yeah, so structure tonight will be, I'll hand it over to Paul He's got a presentation, um, basically, and then will be followed up by a questions and answers session. And for those, if anybody on the call doesn't know who Paul is, I think they've been living under a rock or they've never been on HF, <laughs> so one of the two. So anyway, Mr. Paul, VK5PAS, it's your call, sir. And I'll... Uh, Thanks, Stuart. Hand it to you. So, yeah. I've never ever done a Zoom before, so hopefully I get this right. I'll just share the screen here. And can everyone see that, the PowerPoint presentation? Yeah, it's working, Paul. Yep. Okay, so <laughs> thanks very much firstly to you, Stuart, and also to Melbourne Electronics and Radio Club for giving me the, the opportunity of uh, delivering this presentation tonight. Would have been great to have got over there and spoken with you all in person. In fact, I've been talking about it for probably the last 12 or so months. Some of the Victorian clubs have been interested in me getting over there, but uh, with the bushfires earlier in the year and then COVID-19, it's sort of all conspired against me. Um, plus I've moved QDH as well, had uh, sold our home and we've moved to a little five acre property now. So I'm gonna to talk to you tonight about having fun in the field or, or taking your amateur radio station out uh, into the, the fresh air and having a little bit of fun operating portable. So the presentation tonight uh, is a PowerPoint that goes for about 35 minutes. I uh, Hopefully it's not gonna be death by PowerPoint because um, I have to sit through that many PowerPoint presentations at work and I know they can be very uh, tiresome, but it's probably better you're looking at some screen at a screen and looking at some photos and having to look at my ugly mush for about uh, half an hour. Um, I put it up there, please ask questions, but perhaps if you just write down any questions you might have and just save those for the, the open floor discussion at the end, otherwise we just might go a little bit over time. But in tonight's presentation, I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit about me, just only from a, a portable uh, operating perspective why get involved in doing portable activity. Uh, there are three parks programs here in Australia, uh, which we don't have time to talk about all of those tonight. So I'm just gonna focus on the, the large international one, which is uh, WWFF or Worldwide Flora and Fauna. And I'll talk to you a little bit about some of the equipment that I use and other people use. And then some operating tips, and then I'll, I'll throw it open to the, to the floor for, uh, for some questions. So i relatively new in the hobby. Uh, I was first licensed in June 2010 as VK5 FPAS. I'd always had an interest in the hobby. In fact, when I was 17 or 16, I should say, I, I did my CW. I was actually doing about 25 words a minute back in those days and uh, I did the regulations but I never got around to, uh, to doing the uh, theory component of the hobby because I got into a profession where I had two years of full-time study. So June 2010, I finally got licensed and almost 12 months to the day after I had my foundation license, I upgraded to the, the standard call. So since about 2013, when the park and soda um, activities really kicked off here in Australia, I've done about 500 park activations 
and about 150 soda activations. And I've, I've operated in most of the states and territories around uh, Australia. I was very lucky to go to Norfolk Island a couple of years ago for, uh, with WAA, and I operated over there in VK9. And I was also very lucky when I travelled to Europe back in 2004 uh, to operate in Belgium and Germany, and that was using the International Police Association call. And the two photos below are me with two of my best mates from Belgium, uh, operating down there in Belgium and Germany in some national parks. Uh, since 2013, I've been both the, the national coordinator for uh, WWFF in Australia, or what we call VKFF, VK Flora and Fauna. And I also manage the uh, VK5 Parks Award down here as well. And in November 2017, I served as the, the global WWF chairman for, uh, for a period of about 12 months. So. That's just a bit of a, a brief idea of my history when it comes to portable uh, activity. And I've just got a couple of questions for you. Um, do you enjoy the great outdoors and traveling to beautiful locations around Australia whilst enjoying the hobby of amateur radio? And I'm sure most people here would say yes to that. Um, do you suffer from extremely high noise levels at home? Now, not talking about uh, husbands or wives or your kids. I'm talking about when you turn on your transceiver and you have to put up with things like plasma TV noise, uh, switch mode power supplies, all the other horrible interfering noise that often people experience at their home KDH. So if you answered yes to one or probably both of those questions, then operating portable might be for you. But um, people that are new to this often say to me and, and other uh, park uh, participants, I'm not into contesting. Well, WWFF and the other two park programs that exist here in Australia, they're not contests. Uh, they're just simply a fun activity which encourages portable operation for you to get up out of your shack, go and set up somewhere in uh, uh, the outdoors and have a little bit of fun. I guess this activity is not dissimilar to any other acti activity within amateur radio. You can take it as serious as you like or as laid back as you like. So the two photos <coughs> down the bottom there uh, are of a couple of activations I did uh, a few years ago now with uh, two of my mates. One of those is the silent key, unfortunately now. And we went down the, the Murray River to a very remote section of the Murray River. It's split into four different uh, sections, the Murray River National Park. So we made it a bit of a fun day out on, on the boat. So it, it's not, not a contest, just a fun activity. And then the other thing that people say is, uh, I don't collect wallpaper. Uh, and not everyone does collect certificates, nor do they collect QSL cards, but if you, are interested in collecting award certificates in WWFF um, has got some sensational certificates on offer. And as I'll, I'll mention a little bit later, uh, predominantly they're all for free. You don't uh, pay for any of these certificates. Uh, they're just sent out to you uh, as a PNG or a JPEG. <coughs> Excuse my cough, as Stuart knows, I've had the dreaded lurgy for the last two weeks and up until about two days ago I was bedridden for about a, a week and a half. So I apologize uh, about my voice. But why get involved in uh, park activity? Well, number one, it, it's a huge amount of fun. And you'll see later uh, I warn people about uh, the portable bug because when it bites, it bites hard. As some of you probably know, I know Bill um, uh, does a, a quite a bit of park activity and it's quite an addictive uh, pastime within the hobby. It's a huge amount of fun. If you do suffer huge noise floor at home, which are, unfortunately a lot of amateurs do, we've mentioned plasma TV and solar inverters, 99.9% .9 of the time when you're in a park, you can hear a pin drop and you're able to work stations that you would never ever be able to work from, from home if you've got a, a, a terrible noise floor. Um, a lot of people use it as a great opportunity to experiment with homebrew transceivers and antennas. <coughs> Pile-ups and DX. Um, 
works both ways because um, although the DX situation is not great at the moment with us down towards the, the bottom or hopefully coming out of the bottom of the cycle, but I remember, you know, four, five, six years ago, it wasn't uncommon for uh, some of us to log uh, two or 300 Europeans on 20 metres when you're in a park. They <coughs> absolutely loved the program and uh, you are, uh, even though you might be a very simple little VK, you'll be very, very sought after by the DX stations. The Europeans love to work VKs at the best of time, but if you're sitting in a park, they will really go after you. Um, but also, uh, I'm sure some of the park activators that might be listening to this presentation tonight would have experienced them yourselves. Um, that you become the subject of a mini pile-up on 40 metres being caught by other VKs. Now, if you're a normal VK3, VK5, that would never happen. But because you're in a park, all of those diehards in the hobby want to get you in the log. And I, I've, I've even experienced multiple times where I've, I've advertised uh, where I was going to be at a particular time and on a particular frequency. I get there, I hear the frequencies um, quiet, I ask if the frequencies in use and I don't even get the chance to call CQ. About five voices come back to you and they go, Mate, the frequency's clear, Paul, we've been waiting for you. Uh, and then it turns a little bit chaotic for 10 or 15 minutes with a huge number of callers and then it peters away a little bit again. Um, <laughs> so if you like pile-ups and DX, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's also a great way to see our beautiful country. So my wife, Maria, uh, who's licensed, she's VK5 FMAZ. We've travelled to some sensational parts of Australia that ordinarily we probably wouldn't have gone to if it hadn't been for the parks programs. Excuse me. Um, you can combine other interests, uh, which is what I do. I particularly like four-wheel driving and I, I like photography, I like uh, bird photography. Uh, but you can see there's a variety of different um, other interests there that you can combine at the same time when you're uh, activating parks. So, you know, get your partner involved, even if they don't have a, uh, an amateur radio licence. You know, take, take your partner away on a holiday and I guess if you're nice enough, they might be able to uh, allow you to squeeze in one or two hours in one of the local parks. And I know there are a number of park activators, um, uh, Adam VK2YK, who I spoke to just the other day, he took his son out fishing uh, and it just so happened where they were fishing was a park. So while his lad was doing a bit of fishing, he was on air. Um, so the top photo there is uh, of Rob, VK4AAC. I'm sure many of you would have worked. Rob is now VK2VH. He's very, very active in the parks program and he's just settled down now in uh, New South Wales. Um, but he did travel around Australia extensively and operated portable quite a bit. Um, the next photo is an activation that I did of a very, very difficult park to get to. It was incredibly hard to get there. I could only get there via boat and it took us about at least half an hour to find a spot on that island to, to moor. Uh, but we had a little barbecue uh, on the island as well. So, um, and below down the bottom is me and my four wheel drive uh, on one of the beaches in one of the parks. Now, hopefully this works. <coughs> this is typical plasma TV noise, and I presume everyone knows what plasma TV noise is like, and unfortunately it seems to be pushing a lot of people out of the hobby. But... So I think everyone's probably had enough of that already, but that, that just goes to show um, what some people experience at home with regards to noise. Now, how you could ever possibly work anything through that noise is beyond me. So if I go to the next screen, um, in contrast, this is a uh, contact that I had uh, in a park a, a few years ago now. <coughs> it was made um, uh, on my iPhone. It was a contact with uh, Peter VK3YE, uh, a distance of about 700 kilometers. Um, I was only running low power. Uh, Peter was 
uh, using 200 milliwatts. And this is when I was sitting in a park. So you'll be able to hear the difference. So 200 milliwatts is the power that Peter was using. Um, Jude, there's a setting we can use to um, for sharing audio. Remember Neil mentioned that yesterday? Oh, you're not able to hear the audio on that? Yeah, can't hear the audio. So you need to, when you share screen, when you do the initial share screen, there's a little option down the bottom, uh, bottom left, I think, to share computer sound. Oh, okay. Um... Yeah, try the up arrow next to the microphone. Oh, yep. Next to the mute button. Yep. Yeah, or otherwise you can access it from the top menu as well. So that one there, same as system. I think that might be it. I'm not sure. I can't see it on my screen because I'm not the presenter. <laughs> yeah. Can't hear that? No, I think it's from the no. top, top I menu. Think it, I think you might have to unshare your screen and then reshare with the with the um share computer sound option so share screen so if you hit the you hit the green share screen button and oh, then down share. the bottom left share computer sound. <laughs> there we go okay yep got it do that with students every day so i'll just i'll just go back to that other screen then hopefully this works Okay. Everyone able to hear that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. <laughs> so there you go. So that, that's typical place of TV noise, and I'm sure most of us would have experienced that. But as I said earlier, how the hell you can possibly work anything in amongst that noise is beyond me. So this is the, the next one. We've what, paid it. Can I ask and, what sort of radio that was or what that device was? Uh, I don't know. That was a, a video that I lifted from YouTube. Oh, okay, gotcha. So, but this is the contact with Peter, <clears throat> and you'll notice he has actually got quite a good signal uh, strength. But if you if you look on the screen of the 857D uh, here, when Peter isn't talking, you'll see there's there's no noise in the park here whatsoever. Um, I Papa Alpha Sierra Portable. So you, you can see the difference here. Um, there, there's 99% of the time you'll experience no noise at all. So the only noise on the band there was atmospheric noise, a little bit of static crashes. Okay. <clears throat> um, it's also a great opportunity to promote our hobby. I'm very much an ab advocate for promoting uh, amateur radio. So. When we go out, Maria and I, we, we always talk to onlookers and we always explain what we're doing. It's amazing what um, uh, conversations uh, ignite after you've, you've told them what you're doing. Um, sell the hobby of amateur radio when you're out and about there. A lot of people haven't even heard about us, but um, you know, ask them if they'd like to say hi on air. I remember I did an activation down near the Murray Mouth a number of years ago with two other amateurs and uh, we got a lot of attention down there and a lady approached us and she had a CB background. <coughs> we asked her if she'd like to say hi on air. Well, I tell you what, it was a battle to get the microphone back off of her, but um, uh, it was a great way of, uh, of her coming over and getting on air and it attracted a whole lot of attention. Um, Talk with the National Park staff. The, the vast majority of National Parks people are pretty good. Unfortunately, there seems to be a bit of an issue with filtering information down.
from the top to the rangers that are on the ground. A lot do know about the hobby, uh, but those that don't, just explain to them that, it, that it's a hobby. Uh, and the reason why we go out into the, the, the parks is both to promote our hobby and promote the environment. And carry a bit of promotional material with you. So I, I have a business card and another little card I've just recently made up, postcard size, which explains what WWFF is all about. And I carry the um, calling uh, CQ brochures uh, with me as well. So what parks programs exist in Australia? Well, there, there are three, the Worldwide Floor and Fauna Program, the VK5 National Conservation Parks Award, and then there's the Keith Roger Memorial National Parks Award, which is the Victorian um, National Parks Award. But we're just gonna focus on uh, the top one this evening. Um, commenced in November, 2012. Uh, the aim of the WWFF program is to draw attention to the importance of protecting nature, flora and fauna and to encourage the development of radio skills, especially in portable operations. Uh, it's all about going out and operating from designated nature parks, protected nature areas around the world. There are actually about 24,000 worldwide that are recognised by the, the WWFF program. So, <coughs> excuse me, you can't just go down to your local park that's got the, the slippery dip and the, the uh, playground equipment in it. That's not what the program's designed for. The, the, the parks have got to uh, meet particular criteria to be accepted into the program. Um, it's a global program. Uh, there are about 56 participating countries that, that have official national programs within that overarching global uh, program. Here in Australia, uh, uh, our chapter is called VK, uh, FF, VK Flora and Fauna. Um, and it's open to activators, hunters and shortwave listeners. Um, we don't have chases in the parks programs. Chases is a term that's used in the summits on the air program. Uh, but in this program, we didn't want to plagiarise. So we don't have chases, we have hunters. Um, so chases is a, a SOTA term. Um, WWFF. The Australian chapter commenced in March 2013 and um, I became the national coordinator at that time. It all resulted from me working a couple of Europeans and uh, expressing a bit of an interest to try and get it up and going here. And in October 2017, the program became so popular that I had to get state and territory representatives uh, to help me because the, the program just absolutely ballooned as you'll see in some stats a little bit later. So I'm, I'm very, very ably uh, helped in running the, the program by uh, these people here. Um, each of the states and territories has a representative who accept logs and upload the logs on behalf of the activators. And they also send out uh, award certificates to uh, applicants within their state or territory. <coughs> Excuse me, my wife also performs the role of a treasurer. We don't have an official committee as such, um, but we have been bequeathed, um, you know, donations uh, of money uh, by some people. So I wanted to formalise that process and um, Maria performs the role of treasurer. That, that money goes towards some programs that we run during the year where we offer um, uh, plaques and the like. Uh, the WWFF directory is the reference source for all qualifying parks, and that can be found on the, the global um, WWFF website, which is WWFF.co. So that's the Bible, if you like. If you want to see if a park qualifies, then if it's in the directory, it'll give you uh, the unique identifying reference number, which consists of the ITU allocated prefix, and then FF for flora and fauna, and then a unique identifying number. So for example, VKFF, uh, that should actually be VKFF 0001. And in Australia, there's about 3,100 qualifying parks. I need to choose from. Oh, just excuse me. So, um, 
what does w uh, sorry what does 44 mean some of you may already know this but um uh for the europeans they've always said this it's only been maybe in the last four years this has really taken off here in australia um, but you may hear, particularly at the end of a QSO, you might hear 73 and 44. And a lot of people uh, that aren't familiar with a program want to know what the hell that 44 means. It's really just the catch cry of the program. And as you can see there, the first digit four represents the four elements, earth, water, air and fire. And then the second um, uh, digit four represents the four directions on a, on a compass. So that's what it's all about. It's just a catch cry, but as I say, if you listen to any park activator, you'll invariably hear uh, at the end of the QSO 73 and 44. Um, WWF can go hand in hand with all of these programs here. So the VK5 Parks Award, all the way down to the Lighthouse Weekend. There are some lighthouses that are in parks. So you can see down the bottom there, that's me and Merino Rocks during the I, uh, LLW a few years ago. Um, you can operate from a park in the John Moyle, maybe some of the field days. Uh, a lot of the soda summits are also located in uh, parks. Uh, now, there are two um, award systems in WWFF. There is a global award system, and then there's the, the uh, Australian uh, chapter their bear awards that we offer. So for the global awards that are all issued out of Europe, um, during an activation, you need to get 44 QSOs. But that doesn't have to be in the one sitting. It can be over multiple activations. So if I go out and activate a park tomorrow and I get 22, and then I go back a week later and I get another 22, I've got my 44, I've qualified uh, the park for the global award system, if that makes sense to everybody. Um, mobile operation is accepted in this program, as is maritime mobile, because a lot of people go out and operate from marine parks, but uh, aeronautical mobile is not accepted, nor are repeaters or IRLP, etc. Um, in Australia, uh, the Europeans were kind enough to, and, and the same principles sort of uh, apply for SOTA. You can slightly tailor your program for your geographical area. So we believe when we first kicked it off in Australia, due to our remoteness and the number of amateurs we had here, it was probably hard to get 44 QSO. So we dropped it to 10. But now a lot of people that do park activations will tell you that they're getting 44 and above uh, QSOs in the one sitting uh, now, such as the popularity of the program. So if you go out and activate a park, there are two hurdles you've got to get over. The first is to get 10 QSOs. You've got 10, you've qualified that park for the VKFF program. If you get 44, you've qualified that park for the, for the global uh, program. Um, and that's my good wife up the top there. Um, hijacking the microphone from me during an activation. And everything is done um, online. So uh, you as a hunter, you don't have to do anything. You just have to register with Log Search. Uh, I'm not going to go into that during the presentation because we'd be here for hours, but uh, I'd invite you to go to that global website, wwff.co, and then you can register with Log Search. It's free and easy to do. And everything there is done online. So you don't have to submit a log as a hunter. You don't have to do anything except log on to that website, click on a button, you'll be able to see what awards you've qualified for. You click on that award, and then all the hard work is done by uh, the various award managers. And they're all for free, and they're emailed out to you for, for you to print out. Um, since March 2013, we've had about 3,722 certificates in total issued. This is just for the Australian program. <coughs> so you can see how popular it is um, uh, here. About 585 of those have been uh, from overseas. And this just gives you a bit of an idea of 
how popular the program has become over the years. So 2013 was the year we kicked it off here in Australia. Now this graph shows the total number of parks that were active, activated by the top activator uh, per year. So each year we issue an award to the top uh, activator in Australia. So in 2013, uh, the top activator, <coughs> excuse me, worked 25 uh, different parks. By 2019, the one individual in Australia who was the top activator actually activated 244 parks in a year. Um, so you can see it's, it's incrementally increased um, fairly substantially over the years from 25 up to 244. Um, and this next one is the top hunter stat. So this is a hunter who works an activator. Um, you can see the top hunter in 2013, um, they worked a total of 39 parks, but by 2018, the top hunter had actually worked 894 parks in Australia in one year. Um, so it's certainly increasing in popularity. And the last one shows um, the number of activations uh, in a year in Australia. So in the first year, we had 171 uh, park activations in Australia. That had ballooned out in 2018 up to nearly 1,600. Um, and, that, and that was the reason why I had to get the, the help that I did. And those uh, people uh, very, very much appreciated. So as I say, each year we, we issue these special certificates to the top VKFF activator and the top VKFF hunter. And the two bottom ones, uh, we issue a separate one for the top foundation operator, just to try and encourage a bit of activity within the, the foundation uh, license area within the hobby. And there's a huge amount of foundation operators that take part. Um, Log certs, like I say, uh, does most of the hard work along with the um, award managers. It's the online database. You can Again, you can find this on the main global www.ff.co website. There are nearly 14 million QSOs in that database since 2013 uh, from nearly 26,000 different parks around the world in about 142 DXCC uh, different references. We have a, a special activation weekend, which is held every November. And the next one that's coming up is on the 28th and 29th of November. Um, it's all about promoting the program, but to give you an idea of how, and it's held over a weekend, of course, and to show you how popular it is in 2019, <coughs> we had about 33 activators take part, about 75 different parks, and there are about 3,000 QSOs during that uh, two-day period. The park-to-park -park contacts, there were 800 of those, means somebody in a park working another person in a park. Uh, VKFF Team Championships, another little fun event that we hold uh, each year uh, in October. It's coming up on the 24th of October, 2020. And you just get a team together, <coughs> excuse me, go out into the field for about a six uh, hour period. You can make it one hour, two, three, four, maximum of six hours and try and get as many contacts as you can. And we issue um, parks and certificates for that uh, activity as well. But we have a photographic competition as well. So um, each year, generally in November, the best photo that's taken by uh, an activator during an activation in November uh, gets uh, a prize <coughs> sponsored by JCAR. Um, and we also have numerous other special events. So, you know, National Bird Week, which is coming up, any activator that takes part gets special certificates. Uh, same with National Wattle Day. World Ranger Day, etc. So, as you can see, if you like wallpaper, there's certainly plenty there. Um, where do you hang out to 
catch any of the park activators. No one owns a frequency, of course, but um, the, the vast majority of activity seems to be on uh, 80, 40 and 20 metres. So you can see there uh, some of the frequencies for phone and CW. I will, I'll print this certificate out and send it to Stuart at the end of the presentation. So for those that might be interested in jotting things down, you'll be able to have it as a, a reference point. <coughs> um, what equipment do you need? Well, virtually any transceiver that you can take out into the field. Of course, you need an antenna, a, a power supply, and any, and, uh, any other sundry gear. I'll talk about a little bit of that in a minute. Um, so this top photo was me in one of the Victorian national parks and that's Maria and I laying down on the beach in another park in Victoria and uh, Maria on the top of the summit that was within a park, uh, New South Wales I think that was. So like I say really whatever transceiver works for you is, is fine. Uh, the transceivers that I use are predominantly the the 857D um, and the 897. Um, but when it's a park that I have to hike into, maybe along the Hyson Trail, where you know it's not an easy park to drive into, I generally try and get the weights down in my kit, so I, I run the 817ND. <coughs> the only trade-off there, of course, is you're, you're only able to use QRP, but as conditions get better, uh, it's amazing what you can do with uh, QRP. Antennas, um, when I first started, I was using a Chinese version of the buddy stick and it was just a horrible thing to use. It was really finicky to set up. You had to make sure the radials were out in the right direction, get the antenna analyzer out, make sure the VSWR was down. So then I moved to uh, a link dipole, which is what's up here. And I, I presume most people would know the concept of the link dipole, uh, where you can, uh, it's got links, it might be crocodile clips, as you can see here, or uh, banana plugs, um, um, whatever other uh, sort of separating device you want to use. Uh, so you can either lengthen or shorten the antenna depending upon what uh, band it is that you're operating on. That's what I use nowadays and I, I never ever use a, uh, a tuner uh, with that antenna. Um, VHF and UHF, the photo here is a little setup that I had in a park in the Adelaide Hills and I think this one is here on my handheld <coughs> uh, on Mount Macedon. So I, I use seven metre heavy duty squid poles to get the antenna up in the air and that, that's the way I connect the antenna. I just use a bit of this cord uh, stretchy with uh, the uh, elastic tie and clip here and I just slip the um, feed point of the, the antenna in and connect it. Other people, I um, know oh Ian VK5, Charlie Zilla, I think he uses this method here of a little um, uh, fish hook. Um, so when I when I first started activating, it was pretty much little slab batteries like you see down the bottom here. Um, but then I moved to um, uh, LifePo, the lithium ion phosphate. The little slab battery is only four amp hour and it weighed about uh, 1.75 kilos compared to a, a LifePo 4.2 amp hour, which was about 558 grams. So if you're pulling up in a car just walking a short distance it's not a problem but if you are hiking obviously you want to limit your weight and then I, I also use this uh, bit of gear up the top here it's a Matson commercially made battery in essence it's two 22 uh, amp hour slab batteries very heavy but it's ideal for those situations where you can pull up in a car park walk a short distance and you know you're able to operate running 40 watts for many many hours. Um, all the sundry equipment there is generally what I take with me. You may be interested to know what the orange thing is here on the right. Some of you may already know but it's a, a Bofi bag. So there are 
uh, park activators and soda activators that are silly enough to go out and operate in the wet. Uh, and if it does start to rain, you can deploy the little bofi bag and it provides a little bit of uh, shelter uh, for you. Um, octopus straps, of course, to secure your, your squid pole. I myself generally now, um, if, if it's a hike, <coughs> I don't take anything with me to secure the squid pole. I just use whatever I can find, whether that be a, a tree or uh, a fallen branch or whatever. Use as many octopus straps as I can. If it's an easy activation, and the vast majority are, I just simply use a little star dropper, belt that into the ground, connect the squid pole with uh, the Oki straps uh, to the star dropper. Um, logging for me out in the field, um, I have always used an electronic log at home, but out in the field, I prefer to use uh, paper because I, I would hate things to go wrong and lose all my contacts. So I, I take this sort of um, log out with me. But then when I get home, I use an absolutely exceptional program, uh, can highly recommend it, and it's called Fast Log Entry. It's written by a gentleman in uh, Germany, and it allows you to very, very rapidly um, add your uh, contacts from the paper to an ADA file, which is the file that's needed by the uh, coordinators to upload your log to the database. All right. Uh, but if you choose to uh, 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 log your contacts electronically out in the field, you can do that. Peter VK3ZPF has got an excellent little log called VK Porter Log. And Sue VK5AYL has got something for um, iPhone and iPad um, called Parks and Peaks app. Uh, now, getting towards the end here, but how do you fill up your logbook? The secret is in the antenna. It's no different to operating from at home. The antenna is the secret. <coughs> but try to be uh, band agile. Don't just go out and sit on 40 metres because you will limit the number of contacts that you get in your log. So I always say to people, try and be band agile. Try to have as many antennas configured for as many bands as you possibly can. And you cannot advertise your intentions enough prior to your activation. So uh, get on to, uh, uh, we've got Facebook pages. There's a, a website called Parks and Peaks, which Alan VK3ARH has created. It's a, 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 um, a spotting and an alerting facility for parks and SOTA. Um, I presume most people would know about it. Um, <coughs> excuse me, have a look at the hat charts. Uh, they're particularly useful to tell you what propagation conditions you're going to face on, on the day. Um, try, you know, setting up an SMS group with uh, friends, to let them know you, you're in the park. Um, and you can use the local repeater to advise people where you are. You can't use those contacts towards your 10 or 44, but you can certainly use the repeater to let you know. Nowadays, you probably don't need to do a lot of this because once you're spotted, on parks and peaks, you'll be smothered by people um, calling it. Um, the one thing I will tell you about parks and peaks is um, if, uh, I, if I went out today and uh, activated a park and somebody worked me and they were familiar with parks and peaks and they went and put a spot up for me, um, anyone that had parks and peaks on will hear a kookaburra go off. Um, and for Sota, you'll hear a goat bleat. And there are people that actually, believe not, all the diehards that live on parks and peaks, they'll hear the kookaburra and the goat going off. Then they'll go to the frequency you're on uh, and uh, they'll be able to, to log you. Um, two pictures down the bottom here are Maria. Um, and that was a nighttime activation that I did uh, up in the, the Riverland. Um, operating skills and practices for activators. This is what I try to do myself. And I always say to people, whatever works for you, um, continue to do that. But this is what I like to do, only because I've learned over the years, I've missed out on some, what would potentially been very, very interesting contacts. So when I set up, 
and I go to that frequency and I ask if it's in use, once somebody's either told me it isn't or I start calling CQ, I'll invariably always ask if there are any other park activators there because otherwise you'll get stations coming back with your running amplifiers, you know, 400 watts that drown out those stations. Um, and remember, it's always a bonus uh, for other certificates you're chasing to get a contact from your park with another park activator. And then I always ask for QRP stations. For me, QRP is five watts or less. And uh, then I ask for any other portable or mobile stations who often get drowned out by the bigger guns. <coughs> and then I ask for DX. Even if I'm on 40 metres, even if I'm just using a little bit of wire and, you know, low power. Um, I remember doing an activation on a beach a few years ago. I got home. Uh, I didn't take the time to adhere to my practice here. And I got home and I had about seven emails from friends in Europe who were saying they were hearing me and calling me on 40 metres, but I, I, they were being drowned out by all of the other VKs. So call for DX. You never know who might be hearing your little signal. Then ask for those that can hear you, but with difficulty. I'm sure we would have all heard this. QSB, sometimes you hear people very strong and then five minutes later they're gone so I try to get those people in the log and then finally I'll call for everyone and that's where all the, the fun starts. Um, for hunters I always say don't queue jump. It's uh, Initially at the start you'll generally have a little bit of a pile up and there's nothing more annoying than if I've written down five call signs that I'm going to work in order that somebody calls in between and over. Uh, and tries to cheat the system. I, I generally don't acknowledge those stations or I tell them, please stand by, there's five or six stations ahead of you. They need to compete with the rest of the, the pileup, just like you would in an ordinary DX pileup. Um, don't call CQ on a frequency until you know the frequency's uh, uh, not in use. It happens quite a bit with park activators. They get stomped on by some of the bigger uh, power operators. And we always ask, don't have an extended QSO with the activator. Try and keep the contact short. That, that's for a couple of reasons. Number one is the activator might only have a limited amount of time in that park. They might be on holidays and need to do something else. So if, that, if they sat there and had a 10 minute conversation with everyone and to get 44 QSOs in the log, they're gonna be there for a long time. The other thing is they probably have a pile up and so if there's 10 people or 15 people waiting and that hunter starts to yabber on for 10 minutes, it makes it very annoying for the other people waiting. And it's a lot of fun. Like I said, I've met some fantastic people um, uh, over the years traveling all around Australia. Maria and I have been to some absolutely sensational uh, places around uh, Australia. We, we make it more than just the, the radio and, and the park activating. Uh, it's all about a bit of an adventure for us. <coughs> As you can see, we do it pretty tough. And these are just some of the useful uh, links, but again, I'll, I'll have those available to Stuart and anybody that might be interested in getting a, a copy of the presentation, I'm happy to provide it. So, in summary, you can you can be this person, or you can be that person, my wife, um, and get out there and and enjoy life. You only live life once, um, and I try and fit in as much as I can every day of the week because every every day to me is very precious. So, uh, but like I said, just be aware of the portable bug uh, because it is very. Uh, contagious. Once you've done a bit of portable work, you'll be itching to get out there again. So that's the presentation, and I think you've got me back. So I hope we do. Now, okay, thank you, Paul. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. It was uh, very, very, very interesting. The um, what I was going to say, we're going to throw it open now to questions. The only thing I ask is. Uh, only unmute mute your mic when you uh, want to make raise a question and then close it afterwards, just so we don't get sort of tripping over each other. And um, 
when, as I said before, introduce yourself and your call sign at the time, just so if Paul has anything he wants to respond back to you later, if any questions come up, he can, more simply. So Paul, I'll leave it to you and uh, we'll throw the floor open to questions. Yeah, far away. I had to really rush through that because there, there's a lot to, to talk about, you know, um, but uh, I'm just cognizant of, of time. So if, if you do have any specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them. One thing I have to go and question is, how's your voice hanging together? Uh, it's just, just there. Just. All right. Mm. Thank you very much. Good thing I don't barrack for Richmond. It'll be even worse. So, <laughs> Okay. It's the, the floor is open. Well, I'll start with one, if nobody minds. Mark, VK3EET. Hi, Paul. We've spoken a few times on air. Um, Sue's iOS app is brilliant, but she seems to be struggling a bit with compatibility with the new version of iOS. Have you heard anything about how she's coming along with that? Not really, Mark. Um, yeah, I, I, I was meant to liaise with Sue last year uh, in the development stage of it. I know some other amateurs did, but no, I'm not really sure. I, I try and promote Sue's uh, app as much as I can, um, but yeah, like I say, I'm, I, I really like using paper in, in the field myself, but I know a lot of people are using her app. Um, I'm not, I, I wouldn't be able to answer your question. I'm sorry, Mark. Oh, that's, that's great. Th thanks anyway. I've got, I've got a question, uh, Paul. Yeah. Yeah, hi, Bill, uh, VK3CWF here. Um, uh, it's not exactly radio, but it, I know you do it on your uh, your trips. Uh, just wondering what sort of lens you use on your camera, because I've seen some fantastic photography associated with your outings. Uh, I don't know about fantastic, <laughs> Bill. I, know, I need a lot of need a lot more practice. Um, yeah, I've got a, a, a Nikon, um, and I, I, it's a two to five hundred uh, lens uh, that I use. I was actually out today here on the property because uh, the cockies and the corellas started to go absolutely ballistic there at one stage and I looked up and there was a big wedge-tailed eagle up in the sky so I snapped a few photos there um, but uh, yeah that's that's what I use I've got a, a, a D750 uh, Nikon uh, and then the big telephoto uh, lens but I need I need a lot more practice Bill. <laughs> Uh, as you probably know, I've, uh, I've been taking a few photos myself recently. Um, and yeah, just one more question. Do you normally use a tripod with a 500mm lens? I've got a, one of those monopoles uh, because it's, it's, it's a very, very heavy lens. Um, yeah. now, you, I, you can't always practically use that, but it is good. You know? And if I, don't, if I don't have that, then I'll try and support it you know, on, on something else, you know, whether it's on a, a tree or a post or... Yeah, because I, I just noticed that the, some of those lenses weigh two kilograms, just the lens. They are they are very heavy, and particularly if you're photographing small birds at long distances, you don't want any movement at all in the, yeah. the lens, if at all possible. Yeah, yeah. Good, okay, thanks for that. Enjoyed your presentation, it's been great. Yeah, sorry about the coughing, but uh, this time last week I was in bed with the shakes, so... One good thing about lockdown here is we haven't had many colds getting around. No, well, it's 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 been the same here. The the number of flus uh, this year has uh, really significantly dropped here. But uh, no, it's just a bit of typical bronchitis that I get every year, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Joys of the seasons. Good, thanks. Tony, VK3 uh, KKP. Good evening. Hey, Tony, how are you? I'm pretty good. And yourself? Very good, mate. Thank you very much for the presentation. But I've got a question. Uh, what happens if I'm operating portable from a park? Um, and uh, does that disadvantage the participants if I don't send a log in? Yeah. Now, the, 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 log, the log has to uh, be submitted. So in, in the summits on the air program, for example, uh, it's both the activator and the chaser have to get onto the database because the database for SOTA is accessible. Um, but uh, to, to try and prevent um, uh, data entry issues, 
which I know the SOTA, the SOTA database has really experienced problems with data entry <coughs> in, uh, in WWFF, but the hunter doesn't have to do anything. It's just the activator has to provide a log. Now, until that log is uploaded into the system, those that work to you can't claim that contact, that part. So what I say to people is, um, e even if you go out to, you know, for example, the Grampians National Park uh, tomorrow, and you only get eight contacts, I'd still encourage you, uh, even though you haven't got the 10 and qualified the park yourself, once your log is in the system, those eight people that work to you will be able to qualify that park. And then you might go back a month later and get another two. And so therefore you've qualified. So it, it, it is important that you provide a, a log because even though you may not have qualified the park, your log is what everyone's waiting to be uploaded to the system so that they can uh, claim that park. Yes, thanks, Paul. That's very clear. And, and it's look on, honestly, it's it's so easy. I I, uh, I I use paper, and I just I can't highly recommend uh, Burns program enough. And that's that fast log entry. It's it's very very easy to use. And um, you know, I look anecdotally, I, I might be able to enter a uh, hundred QSOs uh, in around about five minutes on that program. That that's how little amount of time it takes. It's it's very, very good because um, the log format that uh, we require as uh, award managers uh, is either an ADIF format, which I'm sure most people would be familiar with, or there is a CSV, like an Excel spreadsheet template. Um, so you can you can either send us a log in ADA format, or you can use the the Excel spreadsheet template. But it's Excellent. an easy it's an easy, yeah. point. and it's like everything. The more you do it, the the more familiar you become with it, and and the easier it gets each time. Yes, thank you very much, Paul. That's clear. Paul, a question in regard to uh, something that was mentioned. I think it was yourself that mentioned to me over in Adelaide that time about working. Uh, you have to be out, not in a vehicle. Is that correct? Uh, no, with, with Worldwide Flora and Fauna, you can be in a vehicle. Um, the one park program in Australia which uh, uh, doesn't allow motor vehicle, um, uh, either driving or sitting in a vehicle, is the VK5 Parks Award. Because when I created that, I wanted it to be a, a really traditional portable uh, program where, which encouraged you to actually set up a station but within WWFF you're perfectly entitled to uh, either be driving through the park or parked in the in the park and operating from your vehicle. Um, SOTA of course that's a big no-no you can't be anywhere near your vehicle in SOTA but within WWFF you can and, and, I, and I think Mainly, a lot of the reason behind that, if it goes back to the European historics, where a lot of their parks, it's very, very cold and, you know, to get out of the, the, the weather. But me personally, um, I prefer to operate uh, it's totally remote uh, from the vehicle. I, I could tell you probably on one hand a number of times that I've sat in the car and operated from within the car, but you're entitled to. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Paul, uh, Mike Adams, PK3 KMA. Um, hey, Mike. How are you, mate? Good, mate. Good. I've uh, <laughs> I've sorted quite a many uh, QSL cards for you when I was out at the WIA. I used to I, I was doing it up until this year for the last eight years. So now I've got a face to the to the uh, call sign. <laughs> <laughs> but the question I've got that link guy poll that you had. What was the um, Coax cable you had on that. that was very yeah, thin. it's very it's very thin. It's uh, RG one seven four. Um, so I, I, I've got some homebrew ones and some commercially made ones. So you can buy you can buy them from Soda Beams, uh, and I know they're very very popular uh, those antennas. But they're you know they're very very easy to uh, to make up uh, yourself. Um, yeah, we made yeah. we made quite a big. Uh, uh, those link dipoles uh, 
up at the club rooms when we had a club room at the time. And uh, I think they would, we were just feeding it with um, whatever coax the person had at the time. But that yeah, looked very interesting and very lightweight. Yeah, they're a great, they're a great little antenna. Yeah. Um, they, they're, not, they're not the world's best DX antenna because at seven metres uh, inverted V on the top of a squid pole, um, you, you, your signal sort of propagating straight up in the air. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's NDIS. But, yeah. um, you know, it, again, if I wind the clock back when the conditions were a lot better, with, with five watts, um, you know, I, I was working at a, a huge amount of DX with that little antenna. Uh, and QRP when the conditions were a lot better. Yeah. And, and that's still possible now, but those stations have got to be the big guns to be able to hear you. But yeah. for, for around Australia um, and contacts, you know, out to New Zealand and the Pacific, it's a great little antenna. Well, I haven't done any parks or anything at the moment. Um, Bill, Bill's the uh, guru from our, our, basically from our club. And, uh, yeah, anyway, your presentation was very good. Enjoyed it very much and I uh, hope to uh, hear more from you and so forth in the future. Because no worries. I won't be shorting your cards anymore. I'm <laughs> sorry to say that. John Siemens is doing that now. He took it on. And well, uh, after, after about eight years and uh, a lot of disappointing uh, responses from people, uh, I will plug this bit. The DX situation with the QSL cards is very pathetic people do x do do x and then uh, i could show you photos of probably eight to ten thousand cards that went into the rubbish bin because mm. people just didn't want them yeah now, i could i could quote a few call signs but unfortunately i won't mm. uh, not to shame them but uh, you you would probably know a lot of them um but anyway but that's that's going to pass for me now might get called on again to go and back, back and do it. But uh, when you get a box from Japan of 2,000, uh, uh, no, sorry, 26 kilos, 26 kilos of QSL cards come in a big white box, nearly as big as your uh, your, your laptop. You, by, by the end of sorting them, you've had enough. But anyway, well, Paul, let somebody else take the mic and I'll catch you later. I'll go back into uh, mute mode and listen for the rest of it. No worries, Thanks, Mike. Mike. Well, with, with regards to QSL cards, the other thing is, so for, uh, there, there are other programs, for example, the IOTA program, Islands on the Air, which actually require uh, QSL cards. There, there's no requirement for QSL cards in WWFF. Just, oh, the, oh. Just, just the logs get uploaded to the yeah. system <laughs> and then the system does all the hard work for you. Yeah. I, I got no objection to, uh, for the QSL cards, Paul, but over the period of time, but, like my first QSL card was on QRP and that was from Toulouse, France. Um, I think I was running about three watts up the, up the top of the hill. Most, uh, club members that are on know, know what I'm talking about up the top of the hill. It's a, like a, a hospital ground up the top of the hill and a bit of a plateau. And that was on a, a little uh, MJF uh, 20 metre um, yeah, meter, uh, rig. Okay. Um, what I get upset about with the QSL cards is the, the fact that you work hard to make the contact and uh, you get a QSL card and you send it back, but other people coming over the top of you with more more power and so forth, the next upshot you've got a... Uh, QSL card in the system for that person, then a month later you're throwing it in the rubbish bin because they don't 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 collect it. Yeah. There are quite a few in Victoria here that uh, uh, do hundreds of QSLs, and in, in in due respect to that person and everybody else, on the, on the other end of the the one that's sending the card in, don't check. QRZ.com to find out exactly how, how to send the card. Mm -hmm. And that's that's one of the biggest problems we've got. There's heaps of cards year after year go into the rubbish bin. And uh, that's the worst part about it. As I say, you work hard for it. And mm -hmm. uh, and that's the whole idea, in my opinion, of uh, amateur radio is the unknown, whether you do get through or whether you don't get through. And it's the achievement of getting through Richard up uh, there, uh, FP, he, he, he's got a story to tell you from down at uh, 
Cape Otway one year and uh, nobody believes him, but believe me, it happened. It happened using the old radar antenna that's down there, which was down there. It's on the ground at the moment. It come down a couple of years ago. But anyway, Paul, I won't hog it any longer. I'll let the boys take it over and uh, we'll go for it. But once again, well done. My, you. my daughter lives over in, w, in, in Adelaide. So might catch up one one time we're over there. All no right. worries. Right Good stuff, Mike. Paul, uh, Neil Wilson, VK3IG. Just a quick question about modes. I know you uh, spoke about voice and CW. So are things like 3DV as digital modes allowed? And can you do multi-modes in a single activation? Some of the guys have tried um, SSTB, I reckon. Um, okay, they've that's also, correct, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, they've also tried... Um, uh, some of the digital modes. I think uh, Ian BK Five CZ and I and I think a few others have tried JT Eight uh, as well. I I haven't done that myself. I really need to pull my finger out and get back into my CW because uh, it, it goes back to what I was saying about being you know multi uh, faceted your approach with your activating, and I, I'm missing out on a huge number of contacts by not. Uh, being really proficient in CW, but but yeah, di digital modes are allowed, and uh, you'll find when you do your log, generally they go through into the system without any problem at all. Okay, brilliant. Uh, g'day, Paul. Um, I've spoken to you many times. It's Craig VK3 CRG, and g'day. Hello, Craig. Craig. Hello, mate. We had a good old chat a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering how um, how are parks added and are there parks in Victoria? Because I think there are that aren't in the list yet. Um, and how do they qualify? Right. So um, it's, it's a long story. But in 2013, when I took on the role here as coordinator, um, WWFF actually came out of a Russian program that was just called WFF. Uh, world Floor and Fauna. Um, so that uh, list of parks that we had here in Australia was created by the Russians and the Europeans, and it was uh, it was not complete. There were a, a at that time it was uh, almost entirely national parks here in Australia. Um, so I, I set about to adding all of those missing national parks. There were hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, but then, uh, and the, the rules for WWFF were quite archaic as well. So when I became the, the chairman, we, we rewrote the rules, got rid of a lot of the archaic rules. Uh, and now to, to uh, add a park, uh, they just simply have to have uh, an IUCN uh, category uh, attributed to them. Um, so if I... Uh, Generally speaking, if they appear on Protected Planet and they've got an IUCN category, we can add those parts to the to the program, which we which we do. It, ta it takes quite a bit of uh, work. We have to, uh, when I say we, generally the responsibility is with the, the state or territory rep where they want those parks added. So just recently, Gerard VK2IO, uh, put together a, a spreadsheet that's in a, a required format because one of the other people I'd really like to uh, acknowledge is uh, Mark, VK3OHM. Uh, what used to happen prior to Mark coming on the scene was I would get those list of parks and I would ha actually have to manually enter them into the system and it would take me days, if not weeks, to do. So Mark's come up with a, a, a spreadsheet now uh, that's got a number of required fields, which, you know, the state or territory rep has to research the park, uh, get the coordinates, make sure it does have an IUCN category. We then provide that spreadsheet to uh, Mark and he then weaves his magic and uploads the spreadsheet to the, to the database. So um, we're limited to adding 500 new parks in Australia per year. So we try to spread that evenly over each state and territory. But yes, we can add new parks. Uh, 
Uh, and if you've, got, if you've got any special ones you would like added, if you just send a, an email to me and uh, in Victoria, it's Peter VK3ZPF. He does a brilliant job there. Uh, and we can get a, a database, uh, the spreadsheet up and going, send it to Mark and uh, get those parks added into the program. Thanks, Paul. I've got a couple of your certificates on my wall, so I'm going to get back into it again this year, I think. Thanks for all you do, mate. It's really good. Paul, with the, just one question, with the, um, the, the number you're talking about, the ID number for the parks, is that something that uh, you could get from, say, the National Park Service or something like that, or is that something they know of? Uh, no, that, that park number that's issued for each park within the program is created by the system, by log search. All right. Uh, yep. So... Um, Oh, but the, the other website, I know in your email you mentioned the global website, but the, the, the really good, the Australian website is, it's very easy to remember. It's www.ffaustralia.com. So www.ffaustralia.com. Mm -hmm. And in the options, you'll see uh, qualifying parks and just hover over that and you'll be able to bring up VK3 and you'll see a list of all of the qualifying parks that are in, in Victoria. Um, and they'll all be on the Australian website for you. Um, you can also view those in the directory. But the other brilliant thing that Mark has done, along with Alan, VK3ARH, is when that spreadsheet is created for adding new parks, Mark is actually able to um, uh, get park boundary data as well. All right, yeah. So you can actually download that data. I think it's a KML or KMZ file. Uh, and use it in Google Maps and, and uh, or Google Earth, and it will show you uh, where those parks are in relation to you. So I've seen your, your outlines on some quite a few of your emails where you've shown yeah. the park boundaries. Yeah, and that, and that's important because there there are very few rules in WWF now. It's very it's a very easy program, but one of the rules obviously is you have to be within inside the boundary of the park. And some people have been caught out not being in the boundary. Uh, there might be adjoining bush that isn't actually part of the, uh, the national park or a conservation park, might be some heritage agreement. Uh, and that's, that's where that data, which Mark and Alan put together, along with the state and territory reps when we add the new parks, is exceptionally good for uh, people that want to go out and activate a park near them. Thank you. Thank you. Next person. Deathly silence is a bit of a mm. worry. Oh, all right, I'll ask one question there, Paul. Uh, I, when you were talking earlier on, I, think I didn't quite catch your location. Yes, Robert 3B has said anyway. Yeah, hi, Robert. I, I live at uh, Ashbourne, which is about 65 kilometres south southeast of Adelaide, so it's on the the Fleurio Peninsula. If you know um, where Mount Barker is in the Adelaide Hills and Victor Harbour down on the Fleurio Peninsula on the seaside, if you drew a line between those two towns, I'm sort of right in the middle. I'm in a, a rural area here, about 65k south of Adelaide. Yeah, I worked at, uh, in South Australia for about 18 months when I finished off my uh, job in telecom. Um, that was our... Uh, uh, we, we were from Victoria, but uh, it was our, uh, what do you call it, part of our package. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, a, it's a beautiful spot here. I've, I've only been here since May. Um, and, uh, we, I lived in Mount Barker for about 30 years before that. Still work in Mount Barker, so it's about half hour drive for me to get to work on the rural roads. But we beautiful worked, spot here. Yeah, we worked from Kidman Park, but um, we worked all over the place, you know, Streaky Bay. Uh, you know, yonder on the highway to Broken Hill. Oh, yeah. It's yep. just about every, all the good places. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll, I'll be over on the Air Peninsula in November for that VKFF activation weekend. I'll be doing some parks over near Saguna and um, Streaky, so. Yeah, no, some good spots. Nobody else. We were very, very quiet night tonight. I thought, I thought, I thought, I thought we would have been inundated. There Stuart, um, Stuart uh, 
last week you were talking about show and tell. Yes. Well, I've got a, a VKFF show and tell. I just thought I'd show people the, the battery. It looks like it's the same as what you use, uh, Paul. This is the, the LiPo battery. You can see how light it is. I generally run my, uh, same as you, 857, and I can get at least three hours, and I'm usually running them at about 50 watts. I can, I can usually get about at least three hours using one of those. So, yeah. um, and, and a lot of my activations are backpack portable. So I often uh, include it in a bushwalk or, or doing a soda peak. And so you can see having a battery like that uh, is a lot, lot easier on the back than the, um, uh, the lead, lead acid that, uh, that I used to use as well or, uh, or anything else. So, um, yeah, that's, uh, they're not, not cheap, but I think they are getting cheaper. And um, uh, yeah, they're a fantastic battery. They hold their voltage even when they're, you know, right down towards the low charge. They'll still be up around uh, 12 volts, which is fantastic. Yeah, they're, they're, they're fantastic. Uh, we, I, I don't know where you uh, get yours from, but I buy mine from uh, Hobby King, Bill. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I got that from Hobby King too, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, online. And then uh, the other company that seems to do very well with amateurs nowadays is Haverford's in Sydney. Oh, yeah. uh, if, you, if you go to their website, uh, they actually specifically talk now about their squid poles being used uh, by amateur radio operators. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, Neil Neil Wilson, who's on uh, on here tonight, he's uh, he's got a lovely little uh, LiPo battery, which... Uh, you can uh, you can maybe explain it to to them Neil if you uh, if you want to um, which doesn't need the special charger these these ones here you need to charge them uh, with the uh, with the um, charger to ch charge them at a controlled rate etc yep. um, have you uh, have you got any feedback on how yours has gone Neil I think he's digging it out uh huh. Yeah, okay. I haven't really used it very much yet, but it's basically uh, slab replacement. So it looks like the same thing, but it's very light. Mm. Um, so it's a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred grams at most. And it holds about, uh, it says seven amp hours, but it's got a charging pack. So it behaves just like a slab battery for charging. Yeah. It switches itself off. But I think you can actually get out about 12 amp hours out of it if you want to push it because it holds that charge and then drops off. But um, yeah, I need to give it a bit more experimenting. I've just bought another three of them. I was making up a battery box so I can put a radio and everything else in as a go kit. Yeah. Um, Peter uh, VK3ZPF, I think on his blog, uh, he, he did a bit of uh, comparison between slabs and lipos and lipos and discharge and all that sort of stuff. So it's probably worth having a look at Peter's blog. Uh, as well, but um, yeah, I, I'm like you, Bill. <coughs> Excuse me. If uh, you know, look, m most most of the parks are very easily accessible. You know, you, you can either drive into them or you can park on the boundary and just walk a, a few feet. Uh, but there are some parks, and I suspect the same in Victoria, where you know you have to hike a little bit to get into them and. You certainly don't want to be lugging around those slab batteries. The lipos are, uh, you know, uh, much user friendly than the slabs. Yeah, yeah, lighter and um, and last longer. Last and... longer, absolutely. Yeah. 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 I've actually operated the, the last uh, VHF field day I did in a in a park, and um, I operated for the full six hours on uh, on VHF on full power. Um, admittedly, I wasn't going flat out like a on pileups. There were periods of uh, of low activity, but um, it is um, yeah. We have uh, benefited definitely benefited from the from the technological advances in uh, in batteries. Yeah. yeah, I hadn't actually seen them in that format uh, before that another gentleman showed. So that was very interesting. Yeah, yeah that is yeah. And uh, just for others, um, uh, I also use the linked linked dipole and a, and a squid pole and. Um, yeah, they uh, I think all round uh, simplest, and and I don't use a tuner either. And um, uh, I have been at um, contacts into the USA on eighty meters using uh, link dipole at at night. So um, it's uh, although they're obviously way way outside of their um, ideal um, you know operating 
um, set up they should be way higher uh, you can and we do get some uh, some good DX at times so hmm one thing I can say about the just comment in regard to the lithium ion phosphate battery versus a lead acid battery I've got a couple of very big ones in my caravan um one they're a bit, bit, bit too big to be carrying around the place but uh the, the, the performance of them where a lead acid battery if you drill them down below around 50 percent discharge you'll normally kill the battery uh where a lithium ion phosphate can be drawn down to about 96 percent depleted before it does any damage and then the mm. internal bms in most battery systems will protect it anyway so you're really getting for the for the if you've got a hundred say say ultimate say a 10 amp hour battery branded 10 amp hour battery to do in lithium ion phosphate effectively you've got the capacity of double that compared with mm. lead acid mm. yeah um, and you, you know uh, the other thing too with batteries is uh, uh, when i traveled to uh, norfolk island i took a life pove with me uh, and the airlines uh, initially went oh lipo uh, <laughs> no no so they were they were a little bit worried about the lipo uh, lipos are fine if you know what you're doing you know traditionally used in model aircraft and all that as most people would know but they're chemically a little bit less uh, friendly than what the lipos are <laughs> but um, I got a I got an exemption from uh, the airline uh, once they knew what I was carrying, and I carried it in a uh, a life pay bag, you know, fireproof bag, and I, I had no problems at all. But if if you are going to travel with them, it, I, I think it always pays to let them know what you've got, and they will give you an exemption. They'll actually give you a document before you fly. They they sent it out to me and when I checked in uh, yeah. my baggage and all that, I just showed them the exemption that I had and everything was good, so. Yeah, the ke chemistry in a lithium ion phosphate, L L L as in LIFE, um, uh, basically is self-quenching. In other words, it cannot ignite, unlike a lithium ion battery, which is your common 18650s, et cetera, which will explode if, 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 if shorted. Uh, you can actually, lithium ion phosphate batteries you can literally hit them with an axe and they will not catch on fire they get bloody hot but they won't the, the chemistry actually is self-quenching so it won't it won't create a fire well I, I had more dramas actually with the transceiver than what i did with the the batteries the customs were really curious about what the transceiver was all about not so much the battery but uh yeah, so. yeah. Well, the thing that sold me on the uh, ferrophosphate was the uh, fact that it says minimum 2,000 cycles as opposed to like the six or 800 that you get out of the old lipos. Yeah, yeah. Mm. This is a right Solar thing. King brand, if that's any help to anyone. Yeah. Neil, would you like to send me the uh, details and I'll send it out to... Um, yeah, I think you can pick them up at... Um, yeah, it's off the top of my head. It's out of Clayton. I've forgotten the place that uh, does all this cheap stuff out there. Rockby, that's right. Rockby. Thanks, Bryce. Yeah, it was about 30 bucks at Rockby for what's rated as 7 amp hours. They're designed to go into exit lights and things like that as a lithium ferrophosphate rather than a, a lead acid so you can get double the amount of time out of it. Um, the, the other thing I'd say too about the parks program is, you know, after tonight, if it, if it doesn't really, you know, tickle your, your fancy and you don't necessarily want to get involved, um, if you hear an activate, that doesn't preclude you from giving them a call. Because remember that um, any contact is a valuable contact because you're looking at that 10 and 44. And remember that you as a hunter, you don't have to do anything. Just pick up the microphone call the activator, um, you know, let them know your name, your location. And, you know, most of the <coughs> activators will tell you what um, gear they're using and all that sort of stuff. But like I said, just try and make the QSO relatively short uh, because you need to be cognizant of the activator. Might have limited time. There might be a number of people waiting. But, you know, don't, don't be discouraged just because you may not want to formally take part in the program. Um, if you hear a park activator, please give them a shout because they would very much like to hear your voice and get your call sign in their log. 
Yeah, well, it might make the difference. One call may be the difference between qualifying and not qualifying. Yeah, well, like I say, I, Parks and Peaks, which has been created by Alan, uh, VK3 ARH, is absolutely fantastic because um, the minute, say, I'm in a park, Stuart, and you, you spot me on there, uh, the kookaburra will go off and that alerts everyone that's monitoring that website that you're on a particular uh, frequency in a particular park and you'll often all of a sudden be inundated by uh, callers again. So uh, I'd encourage everyone to register with Parks and Peaks as well because it's a fantastic website. Um, and if you hear an activator, don't, don't just work them and then move on please jump on the computer and put a spot up for them because you're not only helping the activator, mm -hmm. but you're potentially helping other park hunters because there are, I'm sure Bill will agree with this uh, and some of the others that are involved in this, there are absolute diehards in this program like there are in SOTA, but absolutely live and breathe it and have that parks and uh, peaks uh a website up and going all of the time. The minute I hear that kookaburra or the goat bleat, bang, they are out to uh, the shack to work the activator. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Can I make another suggestion? I know we're locked down and we can only go 5Ks from home at the moment, but now's a perfect time to put your gear together and head out to your local park. It won't qualify, but it, it's a good time to test it out, see what works, see what doesn't work. So as soon as uh, we get the restrictions lifted, you can take off and have a go. Good call. And you might be surprised because Victoria, you're very blessed over there because there's thousands and thousands of parks and we're adding more and more and more each year. You, you might be surprised if you download that uh, file that Mark prepares that you can get off of Parks and Peaks. Um, I'll also be putting those up on the WWFF Australia website as well for the relevant states and territories and then overlay it on Google Earth. And you might be surprised what parks are actually very close to your home that you'd be able to go and activate. Paul, it's, it's Robert back here again. I've got a slightly political question to ask you. Um, so Mary's Peak, I've been up there about three times. Uh, can you or can you not still get up there? Uh, but but I, I'm not 100% sure that probably the better person to ask that question would be Ian, VK5 Charlie Zuli. He's the SOTA coordinator here in South Australia. I did hear some time ago that potentially uh, you were you were maybe not going to be able to climb that uh, that peak. So I, I don't have a definitive answer for you, Robert. I think it may be the highest peak in South Australia, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Uh, I know. I, I know there was a bit of a mad rush on uh, Uluru as well. There was some talk that Uluru was um, uh, going to be activated for Sota last year. I'm not sure whether that uh, eventuated or not. But um, yeah, well, I, I, we did a trip last year up to uh, oh, what is it, uh, Lake Eyre National Park and uh, Dalhousie Springs. Um, and uh, I think there was someone at, uh, at Lake Eyre that said, oh, you, you're not allowed to actually go up that now. The Aboriginals who, who actually control that area have decided you can't go up it. I've already been up it at least three times, I think it is. Yeah. Um, so <laughs> it's sort of new, news to me, but um, apparently that uh, I, I heard that to be the case anyway. Well, on on our on the Australian website, when we find out a park that isn't accessible uh, to the public, because there are some, I know there's uh, one here in South Australia that's been um, uh, declined access uh, uh, because of Indigenous reasons. We actually put that up on the website in red alongside the park to notify people. <coughs> I think there's one or two in Victoria that are in the same boat or they've been closed because of environmental issues um, and we, we're always trying to work on that but at, at the end of the day the rules if you read the WWFF rules which are fairly simple but part of the rules state the onus is upon you 
the activator to make sure that you're doing the right thing, both safety-wise, environmentally, and that you're allowed to be in the park that you're going to activate. So, there you know, is no but, way I'll be going up it again. My no. are gone now. <laughs> so, I've I, been up Ayers Rock a couple, two or three times as well, but so I don't need to. But, but I thought it was a bit rough, actually. It's yeah. Mary's Peak in particular. We, um, we're, all, we're always trying to impress upon people that, um, you know, that this program, SOTA and others, um, rely upon the goodwill of amateur radio operators. And I think, you know, the vast majority are very responsible. But all, all, all we're going to need is for, for one person to do the wrong thing uh, and potentially it could bring, you know, either this program or other programs into into disrepute. So that, that's what we don't need. We, we have, from a WWFF point of view, we have reached out to the relevant CEOs um, of each of the relevant national park services in each state and territory to let them know about the program. Um, but like I say, on occasions we found there's been a bit of an issue with the information getting from the top to the people on the on the ground. But it is amazing the number of rangers that uh, uh, you bump into and they, they know exactly uh, what you're doing. So it, as long as you're, you know, cognizant of uh, the risk of fire and tripping hazards and you're not trampling over... Uh, protected vegetation and all that—that that, all, all of that's included in the rules, but it's something we uh, we try and highlight to new activators because we, we'd hate to see the program uh, come into disrepute. It'd, it'd ruin it for everyone, unfortunately. Mm. Yeah, and perfect. assume that um, you don't actually have to get to a peak like the Sota, so it may be possible that part of the park is out of bounds, but another yeah. part that's within the park is okay. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and and look, you know, I, even on SOTA, I, I really enjoy SOTA, um, <clears throat> and it's a bit of a it's a bit of a, a wives' tale that SOTA is all involved in mountain climbing. You know, there there are some uh, amateurs here in Australia who are really uh, experienced bushwalkers and mountain climbers, but there's a you know, don't be put off by getting involved in SOTA either because. Um, there are a massive number of summits in Australia where you can drive to the top, uh, park your car, walk 20 or so metres away and set up your, your station. So don't don't be discouraged with soda thinking that it's all about climbing hills because it, it's, it's not. There are some that you do have to climb to the top of, but there are plenty where you can get to the top uh, uh, in a car and the only thing is like I say with SOTA you can't use any part of your vehicle when you can't operate from within your vehicle but within WWFF you can. Thank you. Yeah a good example would be uh, Mount Dandenong and Arthur's Seat and places like that you can uh, you can drive straight to the top they're actually SOTA peaks and, and uh, often are the first ones me included that uh, that you do when you're first getting into soda to get the feel of it. So, um, and usually you can get a, a lot of contacts, um, even with a handheld radio um, in around the metro area, uh, enough to certainly qualify soda. So, uh, yeah. yeah. And, it, and it's, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a bonus as well. I'm sure you, you note, Bill, that if you're both in a park and on a soda summit, you become twice as special then. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and there are some some occasions, uh, some of the lighthouses for the lighthouse weekend. Uh, we, with my local radio club, we often travel over to Kangaroo Island, so it's it's on an island, so it has an iota number. It's at a lighthouse, uh, and it's in a park, so it's the triple whammy. Unfortunately, it's not on a soda peak, but. Um, <laughs> Um, you know, I, I think SOTA and WWFF, particularly in recent years, in the last four or five years, I think both programs have really embraced each other now. And there are a lot of uh, SOTA people that are involved in WWF, just as there are park activators who love SOTA activating as well. Okay. Um... Well, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you for your time. It's been, and all, as always, never, you, one bloke I've never been disappointed in asking for advice and help on. 
and it's been fantastic having you here tonight. So uh, um, from behalf of the Melbourne Electronics and Radio Club, I'd like to say thank you very much for what's been a very enjoyable and pleasant uh, presentation. I, I can go and I can go and soothe my voice with a couple of Bundys and Coke now and yeah, check was, on check on the footy score. I think that's about fair. I think that I was a bit disappointed when Bill turned up with a can of Pepsi Max. So I was thinking <laughs> it was going to be at least at least an OP, but yeah. it wasn't. So anyway, uh, I mean, look, my 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 parting comments are uh, give, give give it a crack. I, th I think you will find it's it's a lot of fun, um, and. You know, you can combine all those other activities, as I, as I said to you before, when when we travel away together. I mean, I guess the beauty now is Maria has an amateur radio licence as well, so she doesn't get bored. Mm -hmm. I generally yes. find, though, once she's got the microphone, it's very hard to get it back. And that's not necessarily, <laughs> not necessarily that she doesn't want to uh, hand the mic back, but everyone wants to speak to, you know, a, a lady. But unfortunately, we don't have enough ladies uh, in this hobby. It'd be great to see more come into the, the hobby uh, and, and young people as well. But uh, we, we've had an absolute blast uh, since the program's been up and going and seen some fantastic places uh, around Australia. So, you know, give it, give it a crack and you'll find that everyone within that portable uh, activity area are very, very friendly. Don't, don't get put off and get cold feet and think you're not going to give it a go. Go out and give it a whirl and you find everyone that there is to work is generally there will give you some advice and help you along the way as well. Okay. Well, let's speak again. Uh, I do have a YL being, being uh, tutored on Skype at the moment. So hopefully we'll get another one back into the group. And one for Craig. Let the cat have a talk, Craig. I just booted him out of the room. He keeps walking in and out, in and out. You know, as soon as I lock off this call, he won't give a stuff about me. They only want to know you when you're on the phone or you're doing something. And other than that, they, as long as you feed them, they, they just don't care. <laughs> um, yeah, it's really nice to meet There's you all after so many friends. times of talking. Oh, g'day, Richard. Hello, hello. <laughs> Now, Paul, this is the club where I got my licence from when I lived in Melbourne. And even though I, I live in Geelong now, um, they're a great bunch of guys. I don't know all of you, but uh, about 10 years ago, I got this, my licence the same time you did. And uh, I'm yeah, I'm determined to stay a member of the club and go down there and see the guys because they're just a great bunch of blokes. So um, <laughs> thanks, Paul. It's been really interesting. And um, I'm a little bit luckier here in Geelong that we don't have the level of restrictions that Melbourne do. And hopefully they start to clear up down there as well. And I reckon there'll be some people itching to get out. And with new radios like the 705 and that that are out now, I reckon uh, at Christmas time, there'll be a, a huge glut of people wanting to play with their new toys out portable. Really nice to meet you, Paul. And I look forward to meeting you in person one day. Yeah, good cry. We get a lot on air, don't we? So Absolutely. And before I, uh, we sign off and uh, disappear, I'll have an ad. Uh, basically, don't forget it's Jada next weekend. So if you hear any scouts on the air, give them a call back. Good on you, Neil. <laughs> All well, right. Thank, thank you, Paul. Very good. Uh, I'm not no, sorry. No, thank, thank you very you much to everyone listening. And I, again, I apologise about the um, uh, the cough, but it was relatively good timing because it was if it was this time last week, you would have seen me from my bedroom. It would, would not be a pretty sight. So. <laughs> All right. Well, it was pretty much five nights. Nine Paul, so don't stress. Okay, thanks very much, Richard. Right. You're, one of, you're one of the lucky ones, Paul. You've got a YL that takes interest in your hobby. Yes. Yeah, she's she very supportive. I, I can't say that I'm the same for uh, sitting down and watching Bold and the Beautiful with her, though. So. <laughs> Come on, Paul. We know what happens. <laughs> <laughs> What happens at Ashbourne, Craig, stays at Ashbourne. <laughs> Mate, I used to work for Channel, I worked for Channel 10 for 20 years. I used to get paid to watch Bold and the Beautiful. That's my, <laughs> that's my excuse and I'm sticking to it, okay? They'd want to pay me a lot of money. Paul, if you hadn't seen Craig when he went for his license, mate, you... Uh, here we go. Be polite, Michael. It was like a, a jug of water, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, got him over that. 
Yeah, John, John, John and Michael. John and Mike were, were my assessors for my license. So it's because of Mike and John, I actually have my uh, my full call because I didn't intend to do it. Went to the club one night and Mike's like, come on, you upstairs now. And I'm like, all right, here we go. <laughs> so uh, there you go. No, they're a great bunch of guys. Thanks so much, Paul. It's really nice to uh, look, no, forward to, uh, lot, look forward to, uh, to talking to you and Maria out and about soon. Good on you, mate. Cheers. And Craig, uh, you'll be pleased to hear that uh, John and Mike did exactly the same to me. They said, you're doing your exam <laughs> in time and that's it. <laughs> no choice in the bed. Were you up in the Dusty Scout Hall? Uh, no, this was up at the, um, uh, in that little building up in um, in Flemington, part of the oh, um, gotcha. yeah, Hospital, gotcha. yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, they're good guys. Yeah, and I think uh, Neil, Neil also um, got the same treatment, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yep. So. Well, well, you don't be, look like you're suffering. Towards the end. <laughs> <laughs> Do you? The, the thing is, uh, Craig, that what we didn't like, what John and I didn't like, was all the pussyfooting around that you blokes did. Oh no, I'm not ready for this. I'm not ready for that. So you got you got my taste of things. So I'm going to find out what you know, and down you go. Those yeah. three certificates there, mate. They're because of you and John helping me. <laughs> yeah, you usually need to give people a push because they all know that ACMA is going to sting you for about a hundred bucks. <laughs> so they just want to make sure that they're really ready. But once you get that push, you're usually okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. that was the same with Damien. Damien was the same. He yeah. pussy footed around, and one night at the club, I said, "Come on out here." And I sat him down and we sat him down and pushed him through it. Well, I'll have to make an admission now. I, I saw what Buddy, Mike and John did with guys and uh, pushing them. So I went and got my, I did mine externally. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're not the only one. As long as you did it, that's all it counts. That's right. <laughs> uh, anyway, guys, I think we'll let, let Paul go and catch up with the football scores and uh, refresh his throat. He probably already knows the scores, do we? No, Sorry? no, no, I've got no idea. I'm smiling because I like the score, but I won't tell you what it is because I don't want to ruin it for you. Oh, uh, but no, that's right. I'm, I'm taping the game, so I'll I'll start <laughs> from scratch, but I no, think I know what the you. outcome is going to be. Mate, I barrack, for the, I barrack for the Adelaide Crows, so not, it's, not oh, right. the, it's not of any significance to me, but it's, it, it's amazing they, didn't when they you come. Did they play Collingwood last week? Uh, no, not the Crows. No, no, no. It's, it, it's interesting coming from a two uh, football team city here uh, in Adelaide. You you either barrack for Port Adelaide or you hate Port Adelaide. It's a little bit like Collingwood, I, I suspect. But um, <laughs> there you go. What's wrong with Collingwood? What's the uh... What's wrong with Collingwood? Yeah. Paul, have you got a, few, here? a few days? It's Robert here. I was on Kangaroo Island when the Crows won the premiership, their first premiership. The whole island came down to the local hotel to, to see a couple of them that uh, came to the hotel after, after the you know after they'd won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The whole island. Uh, so are you that... back to the other side? I take it. <laughs> oh no, I, I was I was just working over on the island. They were just doing uh, work in the exchanges down that end of the island. But uh, yeah, the, virtually the whole island descended on the uh, the hotel. There's two hotels down there. I think I can't remember which one it was. I think it was the family hotel. Yeah, it's a hell of a mess over there at the moment. Though I was there for work earlier in the the year, just after the bushfires, and uh, yeah, hell of a mess on the the western side of the the island. Just terrible. Mm. Yeah, we were there in '97, but I got to see every almost every inch of the island because they were there for about three months I think it was and uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's a beautiful spot beautiful, yeah, beautiful spot. spot yeah it was like a holiday for us <laughs> all right guys I think we no might, worries might thank you very up. much I'd like to also thank uh, the members from Barrack that have joined us tonight as well um, and um, if, if everybody's interest we've got uh Peter Parker doing a presentation to us in two weeks' time. Um, so, um, if anybody um, doesn't get an invitation, uh, who is on the call, um, gives us a yell, drop us a line, and let us know, and I'll agent the list. 
But uh, Paul, thank you very much for tonight. And yes, thank, uh, you. Here, here. thank you to everybody. And I'd just like to, from the club's perspective, pass on our collective thanks to you for your efforts. Thank you very much. And, no, uh, thanks very much, Stuart. It's been a pleasure and uh, yeah, a bit of a learning curve for me with the video conferencing, but it seemed to work all right. So well, thanks, thanks very much. Thank, thank you very much. And thank you, Paul. Thank you, no Paul. You'll, you'll get a in inundated, Paul. Uh, well, hopefully I'll catch you on air. So yeah. like I say, I'll, I'll, I'll be out on the 24th of October for the uh, for the team event. And then again in November, I'll be over on the, the Air Peninsula. So hope to get a few of you in, your, in the lot in the next couple of months. Definitely. Mm. What I'll do is I'll put that in our next newsletter going out as well, Paul, so people can be reminded of it. All right. And I'll, I'll send you a copy of the, the presentation as well, uh, Stuart. And if you, anyone that's interested can probably get it off of you. So no worries. Thank you, All Paul. Right. No worries. Thanks a lot, mate. All right, guys. So thank you. Everybody.